Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Professor Sheldon Jacobson is here to talk about a variety of different topics, and I'm just going to kick it off to him so he can start with the discussion however he wants to. So, Professor Jacobson. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today, and thank you all who are listening. Uh, computer science is a very broad field. The, the stereotypical view of the field is people sitting at a computer and programming. Yet there are so many things that go on within the broad footprint of computer science that when you sit back and think about the breadth of opportunities, it is actually quite overwhelming. So one of the things that we're here to share today is some of the ways that computer science can actually influence life. In my whole career, I have focused on using tools and methods in computer science to address problems in public policy and public health, because there's so many issues in our society that are absolutely critical and are important for us to, in fact, just improve society as a greater whole. And computer science really provides the tools and methods that facilitate that and enable that to happen. Now, what are some of these things that we do? And they're very diverse, but it gives you an opportunity to see the breadth of opportunities. You know, the basic tools that I use fall within the very broad group of algorithms and artificial intelligence. So everything that I do usually uses some aspect of those to help solve some problems. And what we're here to do is kind of discuss some of those problems that we've looked at and give you a feel of where you can actually see computer science in action, even though you may not see it obviously on the surface, yet the underpinnings of so much of what we do in society really has that. And much of the research that I've done with my students over the years, in fact, has focused in that. One of the big areas that I have worked on over the years has been aviation security. And your first thought may be, well, what does that have to do with computer science? Well, in fact, aviation security is really a problem about resource allocation and understanding risk. And algorithms and artificial intelligence lend themselves very naturally to be able to solve problems along those lines. In fact, and it's been over 20 years now right, since I've been working on problems in this area, at the University of Illinois, we did some of the foundational work that led to TSA PreCheck. So the next time that you're at an airport, and you see a TSA pre-check sign, you will know that a sliver of that influence, of that idea, came from the people here at the University of Illinois. Another area that I've worked in quite a bit, and this is more recently, is in areas with applications to politics. In particular, uh, one of the things that we do, in fact, we do it every two years, and this year is a big year, is forecasting who's going to win the presidential election. So we developed a program which involves both graduate students and undergraduates to create models and algorithms based once again on the same tools of artificial intelligence and within theory to enable us to come up with forecasts of who's gonna win the presidential election. And this is something that everybody's interested in. We de developed in fact an interface, a computer interface uh, built mostly by undergraduate students in computer science who, in fact, showcase their work and their ideas through this website. It's called Election Analytics. You can actually either Google it or just go to the website electionanalytics.cs for computer science, .illinois.edu, and you can see how, in fact, we use the very tools in computer science to help make these forecasts. And with the election uh, coming up, in fact, in just a few short Weeks, we're looking forward to seeing how well our forecasts do. Another area within the political science framework that we apply our work has to do with how we do political redistricting. Every 10 years, we have a census in the United States. And during this census, we determine the population of every state. And from that, they allocate congressional districts. Well, how do you then draw these districts? This is a classic problem in computer science. And what we've done is we've developed an institute for computational redistricting, once again, involving students from many backgrounds to enable us to try and address and solve these problems. So this is another area that we have applied the very tools of computer science to address an important societal problem. 
Uh, for those of you who are sports fans, computer science also has a place at that table. And in particular, the area that we've looked at, which interests a lot of people every March in particular, is March Madness. March Madness is a data, uh, a data rich event. And what we do, uh, we use data science tools and techniques to better understand the madness within bracketology and March Madness. Once again, we also created a website to do this, and it's called Bracket Odds, bracketodds.cs.illinois.edu. So this gives you a flavor of some of the other ways that we've applied the very tools and techniques of computer science to shed light, in this case, in a very popular sporting event. We've also looked at problems in healthcare over the years. Most recently, of course, we're dealing with COVID-19 and data science with the plethora of data that's available enables us to, in fact, to extract insights and, and gain an understanding of how uh, the, the virus is spreading through society and the implications of it. And once again, we've been looking at using data science methods to gain these important insights and model what's happening next, why we're doing the things we're doing and where we are heading from this. So these are all problems that fall within the very broad rubric of public policy and public health. And these are the kinds of things that computer science can actually make a difference with and solve over the years. So this gives you a very broad footprint of what we do in computer science. And this is just myself. This is just one person. You know, I have many colleagues in computer science who do exciting, interesting things just like that. This gives you a flavor of some of the things that we do. Yeah, so how did you personally get into this aspect of data science? Maybe you want to talk about some of your background um, when you started studying it and how you ended up in this field that you are in today. Sure. Well, uh, I was like everybody else in high school kind of thinking about what they wanted to do and I had a natural propensity to mathematics and I liked mathematics so it was kind of fun and interesting and I studied math actually as an undergraduate uh, I went to, I was in Canada, I grew up in Canada, I went to McGill University, but I also took several courses in computer science. Uh, when I eventually decided to do graduate work, I understood that math was kind of fun and interesting, but I wanted to see it in action. I wanted to somehow translate the mathematical concepts that I had learned into something that would be practical. So I actually studied an area called operations research, which lives at the interface between algorithms and theory and artificial intelligence. And I, I had a, that was my major and then my minor was in computer science. So with all of those, I started to learn the methods and techniques that would enable me to in fact solve problems that would be of interest to me. I eventually though got interested in public policy problems because it's, it's nice to work on problems that end up, you know, solving efficiencies and resulting in higher profits. But it would be even more important to see how society can benefit from all this knowledge. And this was just a personal interest of mine. And I started to work on these public policy problems. And I realized that what I was doing in computer science methods and using data science, algorithms, and artificial intelligence, and they all kind of work at the same nexus, was lending itself very well, very naturally to solving these public problems. Uh, so this is how I got into this, and I found that the students got very excited about it because they were able to see a very tangible solution to real problems that were facing them or, or issues that were of interest to them and watching the translation of the computer methods to solve these problems. And in some cases, the results uh, happen relatively quickly. Uh, for example, now we have these ba the basketball website and the election forecasting website. People can actually go to it and see the results of their efforts in real time. So if you are, uh, want to know who's going to win the election this year, go to the site. We do an update several times a week and you see how changes occur based on polling data in our forecast. Same thing with college basketball. We update it every year based on new data and we watch as it evolves during the tournament. This is how I got into it. It was purely 
an interest of mine and I wanted to put that interest in action into something based on these computer science tools and techniques that I had learned. Great. Um, going back to the first topic you discussed earlier, specifically TSA PreCheck, do you want to go more into depth and specifically how you used computer science and those technical skills to impact that field? So what specifics sure. maybe? Yeah. Well, we, we use tools from optimization-based artificial intelligence and some algorithms, as well as a lot of data science to, to look at that problem. The big issue, and once again, it came down to a policy question, which we translated into a computer science solution. That was the key. And the mm -hmm. policy question after September 11th was, how do we manage the checkpoints so that we so we secure airspace, but at the same time, do it efficiently for all of the people who are flying. And this, uh, this was a problem of resource allocation, a very classic problem within theory. It also falls within the broad rubric of scheduling problems and assignment problems. So we recognized the connection and then started to build models that would enable us to gain insight into that question. How do you design security checkpoints to meet all of these conflicting objectives? And in fact, in October of 2003, which was around two years after September 11th, we made a presentation to the, the people in headquarters at the Transportation Security Administration in Washington and proposed this idea to them, which they eventually transformed and named the TSA PreCheck. So we did the technical work simply by recognizing that the abstract or the, the real problem can be modeled using the very tools of computer science that we all learn in classes. Great. Yeah, that's exactly what I think people can get from doing computer science is understanding that those applications can affect like real world um, scenarios. Like you said, the name of TSA PreCheck is because someone thought of the idea of making these algorithms and these models, and now here we are today, and everyone goes to an airport, and they go through these, this check, and it impacts everyone who needs to go through that process. Um, talking more specifically maybe about the political um, topics you discussed earlier, maybe would you like to go into how redistricting affects people's daily lives, so how it affects political elections and why it's so important to work on topics like that? Sure. You know, with, with the census going on this year and everybody should register to uh, during the census, it is critical that we have a, an opportunity to express our interest in who's going to lead us in government. And being able to preserve our democracy is one of the foundational important issues that make uh, our country, in fact, every country, in fact, what it is. Uh, being able to draw districts so that the concept of gerrymandering, whereby certain political parties have influenced the process and in fact take away the power of the voters is something that we want to battle. And computer science is a solution. We have a place at that table through what we call computational redistricting, using algorithms to draw political maps. And this is something we got involved with. It's been over 10 years now, but it enables us to create maps using basic algorithms and a little bit of artificial intelligence so that we can understand what a map means. Now, anybody can look at a map when they redraw them after the 2020 census and say, okay, that looks fine. But what we do is we're using very, very important measures of fairness to assess whether the map is in the interest of the voters or in the interest of the politicians. And our job is to help it be in the interest of the voters, not of the politicians. And once again, we're using algorithms to be able to decompose large land sects. And we're getting this information from the Census Bureau, and we're also getting information based on how people have voted in the past to draw maps that empower voters. So this is an important consideration. It's very algorithmic in what we do. So if you look at it, just when we program it on a computer model, it doesn't look like anything like a computer, like a political science problem. 
yet the implications of it in terms of preserving our democracy are tremendous. And the other issue is forecasting of the election. You know, pick up any newspaper, go to any online uh, publication, and they'll tell you, you know, one candidate's ahead by three points, another candidate's ahead by two points. And it's very hard to understand what's going on. And what we wanted to do is create a modeling mechanism. And now we have a website that people can go to to better understand what the data is saying. Because data contains information. But you have to be able to extract that useful information. And computer science is ideally suited to do that. So we're using techniques from data science, uh, risk assessment, artificial intelligence to be able to extract that. So you can go there and see what the current state of the election is based on the polling data and information that is available. It's very hard to understand when you have literally, you know, thousands and thousands of pieces of data coming at you at any given time, how do you in fact make sense of this. Once again, the tools that we use in computer science help people to make sense of that, and the website enables people to see it in real time uh, in a very simple, well-informed interface, building upon the data science tools that we've employed. Yeah, and this relates kind of to a question I just got anonymously from someone. Um, and they asked, um, with these prediction models that you're developing, um, something that they had read about was the wild card, wild card factor. Um, politically with like aspect to social media and how that affects elections. And they were asking how you think that social media and the uh, hype or the, um, the buzz around fake news would be affecting these predictions in the future and how it would affect situations, especially situations like COVID, how that comes into play as well, all these external factors, how that would be affecting these um, um, political predictions that you make. Well, that's a great question because you know, there's so many factors that are unknown in every election. You know, it could be a world event economically, it could be a military event going on, foreign affairs, internal affairs, could be so many things. This year in 2020, what we have is the presence of a global pandemic, COVID-19. This is gonna add another wrinkle to the election. How will people vote? What will influence them? You know, there's a certain core uh, uh, values that people apply. Everybody has, you know, one or two issues that are really important to them. And they typically vote based on those. But we now have new issues. How are we dealing with the global pandemic? Are we going to be able to get to this? The economic implications of all of this. And all of this is adding another level of uncertainty into the process, which means that the data that we're collecting is even more fraught with uncertainty than in previous years. We take all of this into account by creating different scenarios and hopefully gain understanding of what's going to happen on November 3rd election day. But this is a real issue that in fact all of us are trying to get a handle on because nobody, this is unprecedented times. This is not like we've been through something like this before. It's been over a hundred years since we had a pandemic of this magnitude in the world. Now we have to deal with it and at the same time, try and forecast who's gonna win a presidential election. It's like getting into the minds and the heart of the voters and data science does a pretty good job to do that at the aggregate level, which is why we can use our forecast in a manner that maybe individual pieces of data may not be able to in fact inform. So talking about the election, I kind of had a question. Um, I know that with the election at every stage, so much changes. Um, I just wanted to know, how do you make sure that the data that you use when you analyze um, the election forecasting is always relevant? And how do you make sure that people believe like that the predictions are coming from like accurate data? Well, that's another good question. Uh, one is that we use a large, a large swath of data sources. We don't use just one or two. We're using dozens and dozens of data sources that are feeding us data literally several times a week each time. The other thing is that the data ages, and as a result, we change the value we place on the data as time evolves. So a piece of data that we got in September has much less weight in October and then right before the election, as opposed to pieces that we're getting maybe a week before the election. 
So as a result, we take into account both the time aspect of the data as well as the source of the data and combine them in a manner that enables us to form our decisions. So we, we, ha we have to take care of so many things. And even with all of this, there's still a lot of uncertainty. There's still a lot of things that we can't control, but we do the best we can. And that's, and that's really the, the excitement of data science because data is rich with information. The challenge is how do you extract that information? And that's what we try and do in our forecast, extracting useful insights and information where the data may not in fact obviously show it, yet by bringing it all together, the mosaic the picture becomes clear. Yeah, and also with predictions and analyses, you were talking about March Madness and you know sports as well. So um, I guess I'm sure that's similar with those, those predictions as well. You have to take into account external factors and political or cultural factors when making those uh, predictions. So if you want to talk about that. Um, oh, absolutely. That yeah, one often thinks, you know, what, is, what does college sports have to do with computer science? <laughs> well, the irony, it has a lot to do with computer science. Uh, because computer science, once again, when you look at the data analysis aspect, the data science part of it, sports are filled, absolutely filled with data. And for many, many years, people ignored that data. And then I'd say in the last maybe 10 or 15 years, it's become much more important. It's called sports analytics, the broad field. There's journals called sports analytics, which I've published in. And what it is, is it gives you the opportunity to take information and data and translate it into usable information. In fact, for those of you interested in the, in the professional games, like in the NBA, the National Basketball Association, for example, baseball, certainly football and hockey to some degree, more and more teams are employing directors of data analytics to help them gain an advantage on their components. Now, what we're doing is something more on the fan side, which is March Madness. A lot of teams, you know, how can we figure out how the teams are going to perform? And we have done analysis on historical data to give some inkling of what's going to happen in the future. Once again, you still have these big upsets which occur. You can't necessarily predict them. But on the other hand, we've used some tools from artificial intelligence which tell us what are the characteristics of teams that are likely to be upset or to be the upsetter. And we've had some amazing success in being able to do that. And once again, if you look at the teams, it says, you know, you got a team from a power conference playing, a, a team from a, a low major, there's no hope. But when you look at the data and you uncover the characteristics of the team, you realize that there's something special there. And sometimes everything aligns, the stars align for a game. And a few years ago, we predicted, uh, in fact, uh, this was just a couple years ago, Buffalo defeating Arizona. And it got picked up by the national media before the game saying, you know, these computer scientists predict that Arizona is going to uh, lose to Buffalo. This isn't going to happen. And of course, it happened. And then all these sports writers said, hey, there's something to this computer science stuff that works. And this is exactly what, what we're trying to do. We're trying to demonstrate the value of the data and the methods that we use. The very methods that you learn in class are the methods that facilitate that. So it's a lot of fun. The students just love it uh, because it gives them a chance to translate their passion for sports uh, into what they're studying and bring the nexus together to have a lot of fun. So I enjoy it, but they, they enjoy it even more, I think. So with these predictions that you make, what impact does the like results have, I guess? I guess you touched on this earlier with how it changes people's mindset on how CS can be used with uh, um, sports, but are there any other like cultural impacts or impacts that it has on the sports community as well you could talk about? Well, that's a very interesting question because our, our program, our whole program around uh, sports analytics is really based on being a STEM learning lab, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. And it's really designed for the students. And it brings students together to be able to use their work in computer science 
for something that a lot of people will use and gets a tremendous amount of visibility. Our website gets around 150,000 hits a year, just to give you an idea. That's a tremendous amount of activity. Now, in the season like now, the off season, we're getting around 10 hits, 20 hits a day. When you start getting into basketball season, and as we approach March, we're getting tens of thousands of hits per day in our peak days. What it does is it demonstrates that computer science is so broad and there's so much available and it shows that in unexpected ways it helps people see things in a different way and that's what we're really trying to do we want to help people look at common everyday events and situations in a different way and computer science provides the lens by which we can in fact see that mm -hmm. that's great and i think one thing that we can probably one topic we can probably close off on is something we've discussed a lot already is uh, COVID and I guess the um, things you mentioned earlier about your work with COVID and pattern re like researching patterns and um, testing patterns that you've also been working on. So if you could touch on that, that'd be great. Sure, sure. Yeah, I started working on problems in public health over 20 years ago. Our early work had to do with pediatric immunization. When all of you were quite young, you went to the doctor and got immunized with different shots measles, mumps, rubella, you don't remember this, but you're pretty new. And we did some of the very foundational work in working with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to try and understand how doctors should stock their vaccines. It's called a vaccine formulary. And I've continued that interest in public health problems. And when COVID-19 uh, hit, I started to look at issues related to how COVID-19 was going to impact a lot of what we do. One of the big issues I looked at, in fact, is university openings. In other words, you know, should we have everything online? Should we bring people back together? You know, universities are designed to bring people together. This is what education is. This is how we learn. Yet COVID-19 is, is a tremendous health obstacle. So I've looked deeply into the data in terms of the risk to college students, to people middle age, uh, older, and trying to see what the true risks are and then try to quantify it in a manner that will help inform that decision. I've been very involved in understanding whether in fact we should be having college sports this fall and this spring and then uh, did some initial analysis which said it looked very bad, we shouldn't do it. And then as more data came in and updated it, I realized, hold on, uh, the risk isn't as great as we thought. In fact, the biggest risk isn't to the players, the student athletes, it's actually to the coaches. <laughs> and we have to protect the coaches. If we can protect the coaches, then we can play. And what's happened is that you know, I've spoken to people in positions who have helped make the decisions about the Big Ten and other big conferences. And hopefully my research has influenced them enough that we now have you know, plans for college football. You know, we, I also very clearly said there's gonna be games that are planned and then postponed. There's gonna be you know, potentially cancellations. There's gonna be some hiccups. Some teams may not even finish the season. But we shouldn't be penalizing everybody because of a handful of incidences that can be dealt with and managed. And interestingly enough, people um, agree with me. And now we're going to have football, and hopefully we'll have basketball. And I'm looking, I even wrote an article about women's volleyball and women's soccer and showing that the risk was very low, and uh, we should have them. And I'm hoping that those will also compete this year because. We have to look at risk in the right light. And once again, data informs what risk is. And with the tools we learn in computer science, we can extract that information. So just to comment on what you said, I think that that's really valid. And I wanted to say that you can, I guess one could say that behind every big decision that we make today, there's like data science behind it. And that's what kind of makes it so important that it's so reliable. That's a great point because what we have today more than anything else is data. And ironically, what we don't have more than anything else is useful information. Yet data provides the possibility to gain useful information. And it's a possibility, it's a potential. And that's why I believe working in computer science is really a privilege because it gives me a chance to be in some sense like a detective. I'm given pool of data. 
And all it looks like is bits, zeros and ones. But then by applying the techniques and tools that I've learned, I can I uncover the mystery of that data and come up with insights that affect how people travel by air, how people, you know, deal with March Madness, how people design districts for, for their, their states and for their, for their uh, for Congress, and uh, also deal with COVID-19. And it's in quite print, in many ways, it's a privilege to be in this situation. It's a privilege to be a computer scientist today. I am grateful for the opportunity and hope that more people will embrace the opportunity, the potential of what computer science can bring. Perfect. And yeah, I had one last question that was submitted to me, and I think we can get to that. Um, so someone asked me, um, a lot of the work that you do is really important, but they were wondering if you've received a lot of pushback or skepticism from other fields outside of STEM. I know you touched on this a little bit with the March Madness, but applications of CS are somewhat novel, and they are curious if you face challenges around working with these um, policies and public policy specifically with fields of government, other areas that are less receptive to some of these models and predictions that people stereotypically believe they would be, so. That's a wonderful question because when I come to the table and I'm a computer scientist and I'm trying to work on a policy problem or a problem in public health, people look at me and say, you don't know anything about our field. How can you contribute to that dialogue? And then if they give me a chance to speak to them, usually after five minutes, uh, they, they make all the time in the world for me because they realize that computer science is a universal language of information insight. That is the beauty of it. And that the domain is important and I have an interest in which domains I work on. But once I learn the domain and I have to invest time to learn more about what political science, what is sports, whatever it is, you know, I had a little bit of COVID-19. Very fortunate that my wife is an infectious physician. So her and I collaborate on a lot of things that we do. Uh, so I, I look for people to work with who have the domain knowledge and I bring the data science to the table. And it usually doesn't take very long, like I said, five or 10 minutes of a discussion. If people have an open mind, sometimes they don't have an open mind, but they usually get one they realize, oh, there is something to be said here. So there are barriers, but with persistence and a little bit of clarity, one can work past them. And I found that to be a very successful approach. Yeah, because computer science is applicable and people need to be aware of that. And this is why we're doing the series right now. Um, one other comment this person had is they just wanted to know what your favorite March Madness team would be after doing all your years of analysis. Um, well, uh, since I'm at the University of Illinois, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I, I am an alum of Cornell. That's where I got my PhD. So I always root for an Ivy League team. They usually don't do very well. So th those are the <laughs> I root for. And then there's a handful of other teams in the Big Ten that I kind of like. There's some I don't like, but I'd rather not tell you what they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I understand there's some things you can't say, especially being in your that's position. Right. But yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, I guess one last question that I wanted to end this off on was for high school students who may be watching this who don't know much about computer science and specifically don't know much about data science, how would you recommend them to get more involved or how would you, what advice would you give them, I guess, to get more involved in the series and possibly become like you in the future, applying it to real, real world you know, applications? There's two parts. One is being able to develop the methodologies, the technical expertise to be successful. And the second one is having interests in things in society. I mean, the people, I get contacted a lot I mean, from around the world, people saying, you know, how did you get into all these things? How did you discover this? And, and what I tell people to do is read the newspaper or read online uh, repositories of news because the world is our laboratory. And there are so many you know, untapped opportunities to apply what we do. And all it takes is an interest. If you're a high school student though, and you wanna be prepared, take all of the STEM courses that are available to you at your school. Making sure your mathematics background is absolutely airtight. 
taking computer science courses, learning the fundamentals of programming, because that eventually leads to much more complicated concepts in data science. If you have a class in statistics, it's very helpful as well. All of these things will lay the foundation for a wonderful and bright future. And if you're fortunate enough to, in fact, gain a spot in a program like the University of Illinois, a very competitive place for computer science, you will, uh, you will be grateful and we'll be grateful to have you because the bar is high, but the bar is achievable and everybody can achieve it if they work hard enough. That's perfect. And I think everyone who is watching this right now should understand that, like Professor Jacobson mentioned, you can use CS in applicable ways that you may not have known before. And all it requires is the interest and the effort. And if you have the interest and the effort, you can do amazing things. And I know that there are stereotypes surrounding CS that may make people think, well, this isn't for me. I don't look like uh, what someone who's a stereotypical coder might look like. Well, there is no such thing. And all it takes is the effort. And all it takes is the interest. And Professor Jacobson is a great example of that because his effort and his interest in all of these different public policies has impacted the world in really incredible ways in like completely different fields from COVID to sports to TSA. I mean, I'm sure there's other stuff he's worked on as well that uh, touch on a much variety of different fields. So um, that's what I want people to get out of this. And I'm thankful that you came here to talk to us today, Professor Jacobson. All of the research you've done has been really interesting, and I think all of us are grateful to hear about how you've used it in amazing ways. So thank you. Thank you very much, and good luck to all of you, and stay safe.